This talk is about prolactin. It's going to focus on the physiology, specifically the regulation, and also on some clinically uh, relevant points. It's procedureready.com uh, OBGYN talk. So I think this is a good thing to learn about because prolactin is important, um, not just in OBGYN, but it can kind of help lear lo learning about the physiology and how it kind of works and help you in a lot of different um, settings. So starting off production and function. Prolactin is made in the pituitary gland, specifically in the anterior part, by these cells called lactotrophs. There's lots of physiologic actions that prolactin has, but there's two that you need to remember to really understand this well. And the first one's easy, milk production, prolactin, right, stimulates lactogenesis. And here the way to think about this is, so for a, an infant to, to eat milk, what does it need? It needs the milk to be produ produced, and that's prolactin takes care of that, the lactogenesis, but it also needs the milk to be let down or ejected. And that's done by a different pituitary hormone from the posterior pituitary called oxytocin. The second physiologic function that I think you um, do well to remember is that um, prolactin inhibits GnRH. So high prolactin levels inhibit GnRH. And GnRH is gonadotropin releasing hormone, which comes from the hypothalamus and stimulates LH, LH and FSH release at the, at the pituitary. Knowing about that, that's good because it helps to make some of the consequences of hyperprolactinemia make sense. Like why do you get you know, amenorrhea or anovulation, um, things like that. So moving on to the sort of diagrammatic setup of the regulation here. We've got the hypothalamus um, doing what it always does, telling the pituitary what to, what to do. So the hypothalamus tells um, pituitary what to do. Um, it's doing this in, by releasing dopamine, which acts in the anterior pituitary um, in an inhibitory fashion. So dopamine from the hypothalamus inhibits prolactin release. On the other hand, TRH um, from the hypothalamus stimulates prolactin. So normally you think about TRH, well, hey, shouldn't that be stimulating TSH? Um, release, and yes, that's its main function, but the, uh, the, this is sort of a secondary um, thing that it does is at the anterior pituitary, it stimulates prolactin release. And the, dop the dopamine from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary is a little bit different than the typical um, hormone released from the hypothalamus, like ACTH, TRH, um, among others. They, they work to, to stimulate the release of something. Dopamine is different in that it inhibits. And that, and that creates a setup here for this negative uh, feedback loop. So high prolactin levels you think would work back upstream to um, inhibit prolactin release, and that's the way they do. That's what that's what they do. But they do it by um, stimulating dopamine release. It's a little bit counterintuitive, um, but that's the way that it works. And so this slide just adds in um, the second layer of interaction between the hypothalamus, the pituitary gl gland, and prolactin. So prolactin is re um, released from the pituitary, feeds back here. High level high levels of it will stimulate dopamine release, um, which should work to to lower the levels, and then I'll, prolactin also as we talked about, inhibits GnRH, GnRH from the hypothalamus to the pituitary, causing the LH and FSH release. And so we've been talking about um, dopamine going from hypothalamus to the um, anterior pituitary gland. So you're probably thinking, you know, dopamine, isn't that the thing that has to do with Parkinson's, Sancho Nigra, and things like that? And, and you're right. Dopamine has um, four important um, pathways, and it's just good to review as a little side note really quickly um, the four pathways. So Number one, the one that everyone sort of thinks about is um, nigrostriatal pathway, substantia nigra to the basal ganglia, and that has to do with motor function and movement. And so if you lose um, the dopamine from this pathway, you get Parkinson's. Um, the one that we're talking about is the tuberoinfundibular um, tubero infundibular pathway. So in the hypothalamus, specifically the arcuate nucleus, to the anterior pituitary, inhibiting prolactin release. And there's a cortical pathway, right, the... Um, Dopamine is involved with um, affective symptoms, schizophrenia, and that's a pathway from the VTA, mental tag, mental area in the midbrain to the prefrontal cortex. And the final pathway um, that I put on here of the four important, um, sort of clinically important pathways is the mesolimbic pathway, and that's the also from the midbrain VTA uh, to the nucleus accumbens and the limbic, limbic center, and that's important um, for addiction and reward. All right, so now go. Going back to prolactin, so this diagram shows um, prolactin in pregnancy, and we can see here the hormones of pregnancy and how they how they change over time. And so in the beginning, we have the corpus luteum, that's what the CL stands for, um, which is responsible for producing uh, progesterone, estrogens, beginning of pregnancy, and hands off this responsibility to the placenta at around 10 to 12 weeks. This transition is made, and the placenta then stimulates or produces the um, estrogen and progesterone to maintain the pregnancy. And the beta HCG diagrammed here peaks about when the transition is happening from corpus luteum to placenta, making the progesterone and estrogen, and then just sort of 
um, slowly tapers off throughout the pregnancy. Progesterone and estrogen are um, dopamine antagonists, and they consequently they cause um, prolactin levels to rise. So throughout pregnancy, um, prolactin levels are rising, and that's being stimulated by the progesterone and estrogen, which are increasing, um, driven by the placenta. So the estrogen, there's a little star next to it. So that the little star was to remind me of this slide, which the point of it is that estrogen is kind of a non-specific word. There's like three different types of, of, of estrogen, and the, we're just going to go over them real quickly. So one's called esterone. This is important during menopause. It's really not important at other times. It's um, not potent as potent and it's not as high amount it's not as there in as big quantities um, so just think about that as the during menopause one estradiol this is the main one it's the most potent for um, reproductive years this is where we're talking about when people say estrogen primarily it's made in the ovary and adipose tissues then estriol this is s the e3 and this is the one that's important during pregnancy so this is one that we talked about the placenta um, on, the, on the previous slide you know, produce, producing these estrogen and progesterones during a pregnancy um, that this is what's being produced as trial by the placenta during pregnancy. So estriol, the, the um, hormone of pregnancy, estradiol, the generally the estrogen that we all think about, and then um, esterone, which is the estrogen of menopause. And the estradiol and esterone are interconvertible. They can be um, enzymes can change them from one to the other. These things are both produced in the ovary and the adipose tissue. So after delivery, what happens from the um, prior slide, you can see that the prolactin level is high and the, also the progesterone and the estrogen were, um, were fairly high at the end of pregnancy. After delivery, the estrogen and progesterone decrease. Right? And so the estrogen and progesterone stimulated the prolactin um, by, by um, antagonizing dopamine to, to be high. They caused the prolactin level to rise throughout the pregnancy, but they also prevented the prolactin from ha doing its lactogenesis function. They pre prevented it from stimulating the milk production. So when the estrogen, well, after the delivery, um, when estrogen and progesterone decrease, then you still have this high prolactin level, and, but now it can sort of do its work. Now it can now it can stimulate lactogenesis, and you have lactogenesis start. Then you also have suckling, you have breastfeeding starting, and that's the sustained stimulus to keep the prolactin high um, um, throughout the uh, breastfeeding time. So that's the stimulus to keep the prolactin high, keep milk production, and it also is a stimulus for oxytocin release, and that's important for the milk letdown and ejection and having a successful... Um, having successful breastfeeding. So oxytocin, as we mentioned it before, posterior pituitary. What's the other posterior pituitary hormone? It's ADH. Um, and then there's uh, milk ejection, and also uterine contraction is an important function of oxytocin. And that's used um, in the clinical setting for induction of labor and also in PPH, a postpartum hemorrhage. Op oxytocin can be used to treat that. And so now more on the clinical side of the regulation. So we talked about how dopamine is the, the important one to remember, and so the do dopamine agonist like bromocryptine, um, looking at this, what would that do to prolactin? So we stimulate this, inhibit, so down, dopamine agonist, decrease prolactin. Dopamine antagonist, antipsychotic drugs, estrogen, progesterone, pregnancy, what would they do? Antagonize dopamine, increase prolactin. That's just looking at it from the perspective of dopamine. Uh, which is the most important con um, control to remember. But the other way to look at it is when you get a lab result back saying there's high prolactin, what is that What is that telling you? So you, the quick differential to have in your head of hyperprolactinemia is one pharmacologic dopamine antagonist, as we've been talking about, antipsychotics, estrogens, progesterone, then physiologic lactation and pregnancy, tumor, prolactinoma, um, and then hypothyroidism, right? It can also cause high, high prolactin. The signs and symptoms of this, things that you're going to see. So anovulatory infertility due to the inhibition of GnRH, as we've been talking about. Amenorrhea, galactorrhea, decreased libido. In men, you can have not not very specific um, signs and symptoms like in, um, ED or decreased libido, things that you know, might not necessarily point you right towards um, prolactin as a problem. But you can also have gynecomastia, which is a little bit more specific and should make you think about um, prolactin. You see gyneco gynecomastia in a man. Um, it's good. It'd be a good idea to think about prolactin. Hypoprolactinemia. This isn't very common. I never really came across it um, in the clinical setting, um, but you can imagine that Parkinson's drugs um, or tumors that are, aren't secreting anything or anything that really destroys the pituitary gland could be a cause of hypoprolactinemia. It has a lot of nonspecific um, 
signs, symptoms, ovarian dysfunction, metabolic syndrome, anxiety, among others. All right, so prolactinoma, a little bit about that. It's This is the most common of these um, anterior pituitary um, tumors, and it when you see a really high prolactin, you should kind of immediately think about prolactinoma, and then that's going to lead you to get imaging with an MRI. And so prolactin, let's say, like maybe 10 or 20, you might just think that's you know that's kind of normal, not a big deal. A pregnant person it might go up to 100, maybe up to 200, not a big deal for a pregnant person. But then you have somebody else who's not, um, even if they are pregnant or if they're not, if you have levels that are much above um, 300, then you, that's that's abnormal. It should make you kind of jump right to that and, and get MRI. And then the um, other other clues to um, pituitary adenoma generally for prolactinoma as well um, is mass effect on the optic chiasm by temporal um, hemianopsy, and that's we remember what what that is, right? That's the this visual field defect here that we see with those mass lesions um, by temporal, and then um, treatment. So you got surgical, it can, it can be resected, or also you, they use dopamine agonists um, to inhibit prolactin, shrink these tumors down. And then you can also see that TRH, remember TRH is supposed to stimulate prolactin release, but if it's being produced by um, an OMA, a tumor, then the TRH won't have good control over it. So that's the end of this little talk. Thanks for watching. Um, it's procedureready.com talk, so you can always go there to get more um or educational content that I've tried to make all the um, images and things like that available um, for free. You can use this PowerPoint or anything else. Just try to put um, something, this logo, on things that you use. If you do, um, consider checking out 52kids.org and making a donation. Thanks a lot for watching.